For hour after hour, the armed might of a dictatorship rolls through the center of one of Europe's oldest capitals. Dressed in battle kit and steel helmets reminiscent of another sinister age, these men are part of the well-equipped security apparatus which keeps one man in total command of a nation of 33 million people, maintaining a situation which has been in force for the past three decades. The country is Spain and the dictator General Francisco Franco. What future is there for this country which has remained firmly embedded in the past? This week we look at Franco's Spain in Echo, the international chronicle of the family of man. surface, Spain under Franco is serene and untroubled by the epidemic of social unrest which has swept across the world in the last decade. Although Franco himself came to power as the outcome of the bloodiest civil war Europe had known in centuries. Here in Madrid, the main streets reflect a peaceful society and new buildings mirror the booming growth of Spain's industrial economy. The fact that car ownership has doubled in Spain in the last decade is another superficial indicator of Spain's prosperity. The growth of steel, textile and shipbuilding industries has certainly provided an economic boost and this, coupled with the phenomenal growth of the tourist industry, is the basis of this apparent prosperity. But few of its millions of casual visitors ever come to grips with modern Spain. They are too easily sidetracked, preferring to dwell on Spanish history and the shadows of the days of glory so vividly portrayed in the Prado, Madrid's world-famous museum of art. Much of Spain's impressive contribution to culture is devoted to illustrating the conquest of the Americas when regal Spanish galleons explored the New World and brutally exploited it in the name of Spain and the Holy Catholic Church. And now, 400 years later, Catholic dogma is still deeply embedded in the daily life of Spain. Religious, proud and independent, it's among people like these that the seeds of opposition to Franco are nurtured and in the past few years have ripened. These people are Basques who live in northern Spain and regard themselves as separate from Spaniards. Last year their demands for autonomy led to civil violence and a vicious roundup of Basque leaders by security forces. Apathy among these people has given way to bitterness and an increasing awareness that the gap between rich and poor under Franco's regime has widened rather than diminished since the Civil War. And for once their resentment was given voice by the church. These priests staged a demonstration in sympathy with Basque claims and in protest against police brutality in dealing with their arrested leaders. It was a brave move and many of these men are now serving long prison sentences. 
It does take brave men and women to make any kind of civil protest in Spain. But the shock effect of the Basque uprising did rumble throughout the country. Under the eye of secret police, Spanish trade unionists and anti-government student organizations have demanded widespread civil reform and defied Spain's rigid security laws, which impose heavy penalties for unlawful congregations. As security police arrived, an echo cameraman risked imprisonment to snatch these pictures in a country where normal, peaceful opposition to the regime is not and will not be tolerated. Among those who did not run were a number of Basque separatists whose trial provoked worldwide reaction. Although death sentences were commuted, all received savage prison sentences. Spain's jails are still full. Official figures alone show that over 2,000 people were arrested in the first six months of 1971 and held without trial. This indeed is the Spain which the tourists do not see. A massive build-up in tourism has made Spain the world leader in this sector. More than 21 million people flock to Spanish holiday resorts every year, and it's a factor vitally important to Spain, since it is now the foundation of that country's economy in its capacity as an earner of foreign exchange. And although Spanish authority dislikes much of what its foreign visitors stand for, it is largely content to let them alone. Apart from the occasional police raid on a nightclub aimed at maintaining what they call the laws of decency, the Spaniards are too busy building hotels to worry over much about the morals of those who stay in them. Despite a tourist invasion equal to two-thirds of its own population, Spain has successfully concealed from them its own enclosed regime. Truly, Spain remains fixed in the past. Franco himself, who reached the pinnacle of dictatorial power as the result of a bitter and blood-stained episode, has apparently learned nothing. Furthermore, he is intent on perpetuating his ideology even after death. With all the arrogance of a Roman emperor, Franco has already appointed his successor in the hope that the transition will leave Spain as solid and inflexible as ever. Franco is now 78 years old. The political statutes with which he governs claim that he, the Caudillo, is responsible before God and before history. And if he cares little enough for history, he is at least realistic enough to admit he is not indestructible. Hence his choice in July 1969 of a successor. In this speech to the Cortes, the Spanish Parliament, he named Prince Juan Carlos of Bourbon as his heir and future King of Spain. Two years later, at 33, Juan Carlos still waits to inherit the throne, since only Franco's death will give him the crown. But the problems in store for this royal family are big ones, for no one knows if the new generation of Spaniards will remain passive once Franco has gone. One thing is certain. It will not be possible to quench the spirit of the proud Spaniards forever, and Juan Carlos would be a wise king if he were to recognize the forceful character of his people and the tempo of their ultimate desire for greater liberty. If he doesn't, the pent-up emotions of a subjugated nation may destroy him. <laughs> 